Hey everyone, welcome to Everyday Infertility. I'm your host, Savannah Keys. It's been a while since I've recorded a podcast. I feel like even though I have weekly episodes when I miss a week or two, for whatever reason, I just like feel so behind, which I know that's how everything in life works. Um, But I have a lot to share on today's episode and I don't know how today's episode is going to go. It is... (laughs) <laughs> it's a really hard topic for me to talk about and it's very fresh and real and raw and hopefully my story can impact someone else and help them. But um, before I get started on today's topic about my surgery where I had my fallopian tubes removed, I just feel like I want to catch up with everyone. I think it was a couple episodes ago I said – you know, I feel like I come into these episodes and I'm like, here's our topic. And then we just jump right in. And sometimes that's great. But um, I've created such an awesome bond with a lot of my listeners, whether it's through email or Instagram or just talking to people in real life. I really feel like people are reaching out and sharing their stories with me and I get to answer questions for people. And I don't know. I feel like maybe I should start to give like personal updates before I jump into the topic. So like I said, a lot has happened since my last episode, mainly on the topic of my surgery. Um, But life has also been really crazy. It's Thursday and um, I came back to work for my surgery on Monday and it has been insane, y'all. I have said in previous podcasts, I run a sales team, um, but my sales team actually covers all of North and South America, and so that makes me pretty dang busy. I, on Monday, was not even completely healed from my surgery, and I came back, and it was from 8.30 to 4. I was in a meeting. Even on my lunch break, I was like, okay, I get to eat. And it was like, hey, can you do this for me? I need help on this. I need this. And so it was just the craziest day reentering the workforce from my surgery. And every day since then has been like that. Normally, I release my podcast episodes on Thursdays, but the past couple of days, I have literally worked till nine o'clock at night, which some people hear that and they're like, man, that sucks. But in sales, especially with the end of the month, that's just how things are. And, and, being this busy is good. That's good in my line of business. And so I can't complain because we have stuff moving and grooving and and it's all good. But um, it's been busy the past couple weeks and it is National Infertility Awareness Week, which, you know, I feel kind of silly because I try and post on Everyday Infertility's Instagram as much as possible. And I wanted to make sure I was super present and posting as much as I could during National Infertility Awareness Week this week. And the first two posts that I made on Monday and Tuesday were talking about how infertility affects one in eight individuals. And yesterday, I had started seeing all of these posts about one in six, one in six, one in six. And I researched, I went to National Infertility Awareness Week's website, and it still says one in eight. And I did like 10 or 15 what felt like Google searches, and more websites than not said one in eight, but there is just all of this new information surfacing that infertility is affecting more than one in eight individuals. And you know what? It may just be that I talk about this topic so often, but I believe it, and that's so heartbreaking. You know, I I posted something on my Instagram last night about the entire time I've been on my infertility journey, I've considered myself as one in eight because that is the current or previous infertility statistic, and now I'm one in six. But there was probably a time where it was one in 10 and one in 20 and one in 50 and one in 100. And it makes you just think, and I know I'm going to get some eye rolls on this, but I'm going to get a lot of people that I think will agree with me that, one, it is either that more people have access to doctors and science and, you know, just new age technology that we are finding that people have infertility, or, which I 
think, you know, number one, the, fir- the first option is very viable. But I think the second one is something that we should all be mad about. But there are factors in our environment, in our foods, in, you know, our daily livings that is making infertility more common amongst individuals. You know, I think about me growing up. I started on birth control in high school and I took it all the way up until I got married. That's a very long time. I didn't know the side effects that those hormones had on my body. And I definitely didn't even think of the repercussions of taking hormones for that long amount of time. We look at the food that we're eating. And I know everyone says like, oh my gosh, back in my day, I ate the same things and I'm fine. The gushers that I ate in second grade are not the same gushers that we're eating today. The chips that I ate in kindergarten are not the same chips that we're eating today. The drinks, the everything, it's so different. And then you look at all of the chemicals in our laundry and our perfume and everything, and you can go down a rabbit hole really looking at this. But I think if I had to give my opinion, if someone said, why do you think the infertility rate went from one in eight to one in six. I think one, it's more people are seeking help on it. Two, there's something happening, y'all, and it's affecting all of us. So anyways, I just wanted to kind of give a quick life update and then obviously talk about National Infertility Awareness Week. It's something that's near and dear to my heart as I try and make every week National Infertility Awareness Week. I think it helps lower the stigma on this topic. You know, I always talk about the stigma on this topic. And I mean a couple of different things when I say that. I I would love a world where everybody out there is aware about infertility and how it affects those going through it. So we avoid the hurtful questions of, when are you going to have a baby? Oh my gosh, you've been married for five years. Why don't you have a baby yet? Oh my gosh, you'd make such a good mom. So we avoid those things. Two, the more people that are aware, the more science or the further science is going to go, the more that we're going to learn through doctors and appointments and share amongst ourselves. And then overall, you know, hopefully this is something that's mandated by the government and more companies offer it in their insurance plans and so on and so forth. But we have to start by sharing this. And it's not just me. It's you all as well. Whether you're going through it or you know someone going through it or you're just even interested on the topic, talk about it, share it, please. It's so much more important than just an Instagram post or talking to your friends about it. It truly does make a difference. So all of that being said, eight minutes in, let's get to the topic of why I had my fallopian tubes removed. Um, So... As I have shared a plenty of times, but I have been trying to get pregnant for over three years. Um, We started trying to get pregnant in January of 2020, and we kind of took the route of let's just see what happens and try, and if it works, it works. And, you know, within that first year, I'm like, we're having sex, (laughs) you know, enough times that I should be pregnant by now. Something is obviously not working. And probably around the six to eight month mark is when I started talking to my doctors about it and we looked at medicated cycles and acupuncture and all of the things. And really at about the 18th month mark is where I had an HCG, I'm sorry, an HSG that said in how we found out that both of my fallopian tubes were blocked. Now, when I learned that my tubes were blocked, of course, our OB said, hey, the only option for you to conceive is to go through IVF. And, you know, we asked the question of can you unblock them based on where mine were blocked? The answer was no. Um, But, you know, really we didn't dwell on that and we were like, okay, let's get going with IVF. When you start your appointments with IVF, you do a lot of vaginal ultrasounds where they're going in and they're looking at your uterus and your ovaries and all of these things. And ultrasounds don't often show the in-depthness. I don't know if that's a term, but it doesn't show what someone would need to see past, 
you know, you have tubes, which is why they do the HSG. And so I actually had someone ask this and they were like, why wasn't this surgery done when you first found out your tubes were blocked? Well, because plenty of people have blocked tubes and go on to do IVF and have, you know, wild success. That's not the fact for me. So the reason that my current IVF doctor suggested that we have this surgery, and I'll go into detail here in a second, is because the only thing that my diagnosis is, is that my tubes are blocked. And so after our third transfer failed, he really said, at this point, you have done all of the testing that we can do that's not invasive. And at this point, I do want to go in and check for a couple things. So he wanted me to have laparoscopic surgery, which is where they use robotic tools to go through your stomach to look at the area. I had my gallbladder removed a couple years ago, and we did laparoscopic surgery to do that. Um, So he suggested that we do a laparoscopic surgery to, one, look at my tubes and see if they are leaking fluid or have fluid or inflammation around them. This is important because if your tubes have fluid or are leaking fluid back into your uterus, no embryo can survive. It is a very toxic environment, and that would affect implantation. So that was the first thing he wanted to look at. The second thing he wanted to look at is, do I have endometriosis? Now, I have zero symptoms of endometriosis. I have looked at so many websites of endometriosis symptoms, and the only ones that resonated with me are that I started my period before the age of 13, and... That's really it. I mean, there there was – when I was looking at this long list of symptoms for endometriosis and silent endometriosis, I was like, this doesn't resonate with me. But he, he was like, while we're in there, we might as well look to see if you have endometriosis. And then he wanted to do what's called a hysteroscopy, and I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but it's essentially a DNC, which is – I'm going to pronounce this wrong – Di, uh, dial, I'm not even going to try it, dilated in cartridge or something. Um, Google it because I am just butchering it. But oftentimes you will hear of people getting a DNC when they have a miscarriage. The reason that he wanted to see if a DNC was needed for me is if the lining kind of looked off or, hey, let's just go ahead and scrape your lining. So for your next cycle, you are starting with the freshest lining as possible. So my IVF doctor said, I'm not going to be the one to perform this surgery. It's typically your OB, but we do want to get in and do this quickly because we don't want to wait. So he called my OB and then two other surgeons that he works with very closely. And I ended up using a surgeon out of Tulsa who he recommended. I got in for the consultation within one week and then my surgery was the following week. So it was a very quick process, which I am appreciative of. When I went to Well, before I went to my consultation, as you can imagine, I'm hearing invasive surgery. I'm going to be down for a couple days. We may be removing my tubes. I may have endometriosis. Like, what is going on? So I took to Instagram. And I asked on my personal Instagram page, which if you want to follow, is at Savannah L, letter L, keys. And I basically said, has anyone had this surgery? And has anyone not had endometriosis symptoms? and ended up having endometriosis. I got great feedback about the surgery, what to expect. I also did a ton of research, surprisingly, on TikTok. A lot of people, um, you know, kind of document their surgery and the recovery and all of that, and I learned so much, and I'll give tips here in a little bit. Um, But I had a lot of people respond to me and say, yes, I've had the surgery, here's what you can expect surprisingly, and I do not have a ton of followers on my personal page. I think I have like 2,000. I probably had 50 to 100 women reach out and say, I had this endometriosis surgery. So that tells me one thing right off the bat. Endometriosis is not talked about enough. And if you have it, 
I feel for you. My heart goes out to you because looking at those symptoms, that sounds brutal. And you need more people talking about this and advocating for this and and making this a topic. You know, it shouldn't, from what I've heard, it shouldn't take so long to diagnose this, but it does. And unfortunately, from what I've heard from a lot of people, the diagnosis comes from a surgery. And so, man, that was just, that was eye-opening to have that many people respond and say, I've had this surgery. A lot of them I'm friends with. And I was like, I had no idea you had that surgery or you had endometriosis. All of that to say, there was a shocking, shocking amount. I think 50% of those 50 to 100 people that reached out said, I did not have a single symptom, but I was struggling getting pregnant. And I went in for that surgery and I was ate up with endometriosis. People were saying it, it, there, it was on so many organs and there were so many spots. They sometimes had to have multiple surgeries or, you know, it came back and they had to have multiple surgeries. But of the people that went that route, most of them did see success. And so that does give me hope to tell you all that if you're in this similar situation, this surgery might be something that's beneficial to you. So I go into my consultation and I have a million questions. The one thing that I asked right off the bat, which I am of the believer of it doesn't hurt to ask, I was like, hey, doctor, um, while you're in there, can you just unblock my tubes? I've only asked a handful of times at the beginning of our IVF journey, and most people said it can't be done, but like doesn't hurt to ask. And he essentially said, no, you cannot unblock tubes, um, but let's kind of look. So he did an ultrasound, and I'm telling you all of these details because I just thought this was such an interesting experience, and I learned so much. So he talks to me and he's kind of learning and figuring out and like, tell me about your failed transfers and your diagnosis and your background and all this. Okay. So then we go to do the ultrasound and he, I'm just going to get nitty gritty with you all. Those of you that have been going to um, infertility appointments like for IUI or IVF, you are very familiar with Wanda, the uh, transvaginal ultrasound wand. It is um, a very large probe um, that goes inside of you, and it's not the most comfortable thing. Now, what I will say is I – my previous clinic was the – was my first go at fertility procedures, and I didn't know what to expect. And what I will say is I felt – I felt like the ultrasounds were more uncomfortable than – I guess not. And I heard from quite a few women that that's uncommon. And so I was like, okay, well, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm saying uncomfortable. You're saying not uncomfortable. How do I know what level of comfort is different? It's kind of like pain tolerances. You can't measure that between people. So I go to – I start with my new clinic. And the ultrasounds are night and day different. I think they're just much more gentle. And so to me, it's like, well, that's not something with my body. Maybe that's just how rough or ungentle they were with their ultrasounds. So I'm meeting with this surgeon for my consultation, and he goes to do just an exploratory ultrasound. And immediately, I kind of was like, oof. And he was like, is that uncomfortable? And I was like, yeah, but I don't know if my bladder is full. And he was like, no, I can see your bladder. It's not full. Um, typically this shouldn't be uncomfortable for people. Do you have painful sex? Which is a common symptom of endometriosis. And I was like, no. Have you ever had painful sex? No. And he was like, okay. So he's kind of like moving around in there and he's like, your uterus is not as flexible or does not move as much as you would expect it to. So I am expecting to go into your surgery and find endometriosis. So, okay, that, that's interesting to me. Now, could it have been that he was just more rough with the ultrasound? Absolutely, and that's what I think happened after knowing how my surgery uh, ended. Um, but that is something that I thought was interesting. And no one had said that to me before. And maybe no one has said that to you before. And you do have uncomfortable ultrasounds and it may be something to ask about. Anyway, so he gets done with the um, 
ultrasound and he's like, okay, get dressed. I'm going to come back in and we'll talk about the surgery. So he comes back in and he's like, okay, a couple things. If I get in there and your tubes, one or two, are filled with fluid or have inflammation or anything like that, we are on the same page that we will remove them. Yes. Then he asked the question, if I get in there and your tubes look fine, they're just blocked, do you want to remove them? And I said no. And I want to share why. When I found out that I had to do IVF because my tubes were blocked, that was a very hard thing for me to accept because I felt like less of a woman. And, and, and I'm not, and I know that. But when you hear this news and you've always wanted to be a mom, it's like, okay, women are meant to carry babies. Women are meant to get pregnant and have babies, and that's just how it's always been, and I can't. So what's wrong with me? Why am I broken? And it took me a lot in the beginning to truly cope and accept, okay, my tubes are blocked. If I ever want to get pregnant, it's through IVF. Now, I am not saying it's wrong or right. But I have heard so many stories of people that had always been told their tubes are blocked and then they have this miracle pregnancy down the line. And I truly think anyone going through infertility has those like tiny hopes somewhere deep in the back of their mind that they're like, well, I did hear this story. What if? So the reason I said if my tubes don't have fluid or they don't have inflammation and they look fine, they're just blocked, don't remove them because in my mind, what if? What if there's a miracle? What if something happens? Oh, this is where I start to get emotional. But I had always had that what if in the back of my mind. And I'm not saying I thought about it often. No way. You know, maybe once every couple months, but but I had tubes. And what if they unblocked themselves? Or what if something slipped through? It, it's just something you think of. And so for me, if there was nothing wrong with them, I wanted to keep them. And I talked with my husband about that and we made that decision. And on surgery day, I said the same thing. If there's nothing wrong with them, I want to keep them. Um, And so then he said, okay, well, if I get in there and there's endometriosis, here's my plan of attack on how to take that out. He did did the – If he were to find endometriosis, he would have removed it by excision. I understand that there's excision, ablation, and lasering. From what I have talked about with a lot of people um, who have had a laparoscopic surgery to remove endometriosis is that excision is usually the best. It's where they're actually cutting it out. So they're able to get deeper to prevent that regrowth. Ablation, I believe, is where they just scrape it. And so you're, again, not able to get as uh, deep and remove as much. And then laser is, you know, exactly what it sounds like, lasering them out. So he was going to, if he found endometriosis, remove it by excision, which I was glad to hear that. And then he explained to me that the DNC is just to get in there, look at the current lining, and kind of start fresh for the next round and the next transfer. So I go on my merry way, I go home, and, you know, honestly, I was trying to best prepare myself to have my tubes removed, but also best prepare myself to have endometriosis, especially him saying, like, while I was in there for the ultrasound, like, your your uterus didn't move as much as I would expect it to. So I'm like, well, okay, that's it. I probably have endometriosis. Think of the worst, you know, expect the worst, and hopefully we have better outcomes. Um, so throughout this week, between my consultation and my surgery, I'm talking to a lot of people, I'm asking a lot of questions. And one thing that I thought was super interesting is I actually had a handful of people reach out and say, I had thought my tubes were blocked for X amount of time. I had this surgery. And what ended up happening is that there was actually just endometriosis on my tubes. And once they removed that, I was able to get pregnant naturally. Now, I was not getting my hopes up for this, but it, I mean, that was good to hear that that is a possibility. So I go into the surgery day and I was nervous. One, I had had a laparoscopic surgery before. 
like I said, to get my gallbladder removed. And it was very painful. So they actually cut a few incisions into your stomach and they fill your stomach up with gas. I mean, I am probably picturing myself looking nine months pregnant or like I have a basketball in my stomach during the surgery. They do that so they can use the robotic tools and actually see what they're looking at. So I knew not only does the gas pain, it somehow finds itself in your shoulder. And so you have this like really intense gas pain in your shoulder and like your collarbone area after the surgery. And then of course the incision area, they're cutting through your ab muscles. And so it hurts to cough. It hurts to move. It hurts to sit up. It hurts to walk. So I was scared because I knew the recovery was going to be painful. I was also scared because we're talking about potentially finding another diagnosis or removing my tubes or something going wrong. And so I went into the surgery, which we had to drive 90 miles, which is, you know, an hour and a half to the surgery. So I just had a lot of time to like worry. Luckily, they gave me like basically a Valium before I went back and the surgery took about an hour and I was out and everything was fine. One thing that's funny that I'll just kind of tell you guys. Um, so I'm in the post-op area and I guess I'm coming off the anesthesia and I woke up screaming the F word because I was in so much pain. And I'm like, F actually saying the word. And the nurses, I mean, I woke up screaming. So they're like, oh my gosh, is everything okay? And I'm like, no, it effing hurts. Help me. I'm obviously not in the right state of mind. So normal me probably wouldn't have done that. But they gave me some medicine through my IV. And as it started to go down, I was like, oh my gosh, are there any children around? And I was just screaming the F word. And they were like, no, there's no children. And then I would just kind of was loopy coming off the anesthesia and now given more pain medicine. I was like, where am I? And she's like, you're in the post-op recovery area. And I was like, no, 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 no. Where am I? And she's like, oh, you're at this hospital. And I was like, no. Am I in Oklahoma City? Don't know why that was my first question. And she just said, no, you're in Tulsa. Well, for those that don't know, um, my husband grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had our first official date in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so we named our dog. Tulsa after the town just because of the significance. And so she just says, no, you're in Tulsa. And I'm like, oh, my dogs are here. And I'm sure she's just like, what is this? Like, you are crazy lady. But anyways, she kept saying Tulsa and I was asking for my dogs. So I just thought that would be a quick little funny story. But anyway, so I wake up from the surgery and I am in a lot of pain. They roll me back to the room that I originally was in and they brought Drake back in and he's like, do you know what happened? And I'm like, no. I mean, you're the first person I'm talking to. Um, And he's like, okay, well, they did remove both tubes. They were full of fluid. Um, And then they found a handful of adhesions that were surrounding your ovaries and your uterus and just different areas but there was no endometriosis. And so I immediately was met with like these different emotions. One, sadness, because while I was preparing myself for them to remove my tubes, there's just something, the reality hits different. And so I was sad. I was like, okay, all right. Um, What do you mean adhesions? And you know, Drake's not a doctor. He didn't even know what an adhesion was. And he was also trying to like keep up with the the medical jargon and understand, you know, the body parts and all this. And he was like, I don't know. He drew me a picture and he hands me this picture. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And he's like, he just said there were adhesions around your tubes and your ovaries and your uterus that he removed. And there was a handful of them. Um, but the doctor didn't find endometriosis and he is extremely pleased with how everything went and he is hopeful, um, based on every conversation he's had with your IVF doctor that things, you know, should hopefully be successful moving forward. So part of you, part of you, part of me is upset. I mean, you just removed an organ from my body. You just removed my tubes. You just removed what allows most people to get pregnant. And it, 
I already knew I was going to have to go through IVF to get pregnant. It That wasn't a voila moment. It was the removal of that tiny bit of hope that something could happen. And I mean, it just solidified it even more. IVF is our only option. If me and Drake want to have a baby, if we want to have a second baby, if we want to have a third baby, I have to go through IVF every time. And you just start to have this flood of emotions. But then this flood of reality of like, how much is this going to cost us? How long is this going to take? Is this ever going to work? Are we ever going to be able to have a baby? What if we have one and we can't have two? What if we have two and we can't have three? What if I have to have another egg retrieval and because we've removed my tubes, it somehow affected my ovaries? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? On top of the sadness. And so this is all happening while I'm like laying in bed. So they they discharge me. It's an outpatient surgery and we start to drive back to Oklahoma City And again, 90 miles, an hour and a half. And that was a really painful car ride. Um, Every little bump hurt. You know, you're sitting in a car seat where it's like you can't really get comfortable. I brought a pillow so the the, um, seatbelt wasn't on my incisions. Well, then the pillow's on your incisions and it hurts. And it just was a really rough recovery. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I, I get home, pain. Hasn't been long enough to take a pain medicine. So I'm laying in bed hurting. You know, you have all of this gas. I will say from my gallbladder um, surgery to this surgery, night and day difference, they actually sucked out the gas in this surgery. So I wasn't as bloated and there wasn't as much gas pain. But because of that, the gas pain started earlier. So like the minute I got home from surgery, in pain, shoulders hurting, you know, incisions are hurting because you have gas, you're coughing, the coughs hurt because your abs have been sliced open. They did a cut. If this is like my belly button, for those of you watching on YouTube, they sliced through my belly button. They did kind of over to the side. And then they made a cut right above my vagina where a C-section scar would be. Side note, to those of you who have had a C-section and you have been cut in that area, you are superheroes. I have had now two laparoscopic surgeries where I've been cut in the midsection around my belly button, and that is painful. It is exactly one week and one day out from my surgery, and the the incision that is around my C-section, where a C-section would be, still hurts. It is so tender, and I don't know why, but I like continue to bump it on things, and it just, uh, all I am saying is those who have had a C-section, dealing with that incision, and mine is much smaller, you guys are superheroes. I mean, deserve to wear a cape every single where you go and you probably should like get the first parking spot at every place. All of that to be said, the first day was really rough. I had to have help getting in and out of bed. I had to have help sitting on the toilet and getting off the toilet because we did the laparoscopic surgery, but also the DNC. I actually had someone on Instagram tell me I had the same exact surgery and one of the most painful things was the first time I peed after because they went through, they scraped, you know, like just everything down there is really sensitive and holy shit, she could not have been more correct. It felt like I was peeing out razor blades that were chopped up into little tiny pieces mixed with shards of glass. I mean, it was just horrible. The second day. Um, you know, it got better every day, but I was, I was in extreme pain. So I had the surgery on Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I was in bed. I did not get out of bed unless I had to go to the bathroom or Drake wasn't around to bring me food or water. Um, Saturday is the first day I actually got out of bed and walked to my couch and laid on my couch because I thought I was going to go insane staring at the same four walls for another day. Again, didn't really move too much from couch to bathroom, couch to bed. Sunday, so what would that be? One, two, three, four, four days post-op is the first day I actually kind of walked around my house and and was a little bit more mobile. And then Monday, I went back to work. It was a work-from-home day, so it was nice because I just sat in a chair. 
So really it wasn't until six days post-surgery that I was like actually leaving my house, driving, walking around. It was really painful. Um, now I have heard people have much quicker rebounds in, in this surgery and I've had people, I've heard of people that take much longer. Everybody's body is different, but I do want to give everyone a couple tips because I myself wanted those same tips going into the surgery. And so I think that would, you know, be something that is helpful. One, I bought a couple pairs of pajamas that were really, really loose. Like, I mean, I'm talking straight up matching pajama sets that you could like stretch out to here. They're super high up. They're not going to touch anything on your stomach. And if you, if they do, they're actually really soft. Um, so I invested in three pairs of like really nice pajamas. And when I say really nice, I'm not talking like super expensive, like, but they were like kind of the bamboo material and just really light and easy to get in and out of. I also bought period underwear. And that sounds so weird, but um, they're going to send you home in like a either a king size pad or like a diaper. And um, I'm not wearing a diaper or a king size pad for multiple days, especially when it's not something like childbirth that is that much bleeding and tearing and all of that. Um, So I bought like the period underwear, which I had no idea about any of these. I actually had a friend at happy hour a couple weeks talk about them and she was like saying they're magic. They are. I don't know what voodoo weird stuff is going on with them, but yes, they absorb, they work. Much more comfortable because you are so sore and because you don't want anything, you know, on the incisions. I thought those were really helpful because I did bleed for about three days and then I spotted, I'm still spotting and it's a week and a day later. Um, Stool softeners, because you're taking pain medicine and you're under anesthesia, I did start stool softeners the day of surgery just purely because I was busy and forgot. I do wish I would have started them um, a couple of days before and maybe took more than the bottle said because things were a little rough post-surgery. And when you're dealing with that business um, and your stomach muscles have been cut into, like it's just not a good mixture. So that is also a tip I would give you. Um, Have someone with you for probably the first day or two just because, like I said, it's going to be hard getting up, getting out, but you're going to sleep a lot. So, you know, if I wasn't sleeping, I was reading a book or watching a Netflix show or whatever. Other than that, you know, I would just expect – as I said, the first P to be painful. And, you know, the the recovery to take, I would say, five to six days of being down. And then the next week or so, you're still sore. So I actually do go back to the surgeon Tuesday. So that's basically two weeks from the surgery to get released Since the surgery, I've not been able to lift like anything heavy. I have not been able to work out or exercise. I've not been able to take a bath because of the DNC. They don't want risk of a infection. Um, No sex, no tampons, no sticking anything in there. Also for risk of infection. Um, And so when I go back on Tuesday, I'm hoping I get kind of a full in-depth analysis of what the surgery was and how it went. Because right now all I have is what Drake has told me after the surgery. And then I'm cleared. So that's it. You know, I'm thankful for the surgery. As hard as it has been for me to accept I no longer have my tubes, I am really hopeful. I think it was the third day after my surgery. I was laying in bed and I went to an infertility or an IVF Facebook group And I searched in the search bar, tube removal surgery, and I searched a couple different things. And those things can be scary. You know, there were a few people that said, don't have your tubes removed if you're not done having egg retrievals because lack of tubes can lead to lack of blood flow and could lead to less eggs. And, you know, but then I would also see people like, that's not true. So then I would Google it and get 50-50. I don't think it's true. And so it's like, that did scare me because – we only have three embryos left, and, and what if we need to do another egg retrieval? 
But what gave me hope is the vast majority of people, after they had their tubes removed specifically for fluid in the tubes, and I don't know if I specifically mentioned this, but my tubes were removed because they were full of fluid and they were spilling back into my uterus. That is called hydrosalpinx. If you want to look it up, it's H-Y-D-R-O-S-A-L-P-I-N-X, hydrosalpinx. So when I looked it up, I was very specifically looking at women who had blocked tubes, who had had transfers, who had the tubes removed because of hydrosalpinx. Most of them had a successful next transfer. And so all of that to say, as sad as I am, which I am grieving the loss of my tubes, and I am so proud of myself for holding it together this entire podcast because I've cried every day since the surgery. Some days it's been like I need to take a minute and just have a good 30-minute cry, and some days it's been like a a 30-second like tear up. It's sad. I'm grieving, and I think that's normal. Um... But it does give me hope. And I just keep trying to remind myself my tubes were already blocked. Transfers weren't working. We think, because you'll never know for sure, but we think it's because of the fluid. So what if I go into my next transfer and it works? Then this will have all been worth it. I'm not saying I won't be sad I don't have tubes anymore. But it will be worth it if I can get pregnant. And so I just keep trying to remind myself that every step we do within this IVF journey is one step closer to the baby. And we may experience failures and we may experience setbacks, but we're on the right path. And if my tubes were blocked and they weren't working before, it's not like I'm setting myself up for failure or taking a risk. Or taking 10 steps back, I'm just removing that like teeny tiny bit of hope I had in the very back of my mind that honestly, I didn't think about that often. So if you were in a similar position where you have blocked tubes and you have had failure after failure after failure, I would suggest this surgery. If you are just kind of at a breaking point and you're banging your head against the wall and you're like, what is not working, I would suggest maybe talking to your doctor about this surgery because what if you do have silent endometriosis? What if you're like that large majority of 50 to 100 women that reached out to me and said, I struggled with infertility. I did not have a single symptom. I went in for this surgery and we found answers. I think... And this podcast is for you all. It's not for me, but I think this episode has helped me cope a little bit more with this. And I hope you hear my story if you're in similar shoes and it helps you as well. So as far as next steps, we are moving forward with a fifth round of IVF and a fourth transfer cycle. And we are just hoping and praying that by removing the tubes, We have a successful transfer, finally. Um, That's it. That's all I have for you guys. If you have specific questions about the surgery or tube removal or anything like that, please email me. Reach out to me on Instagram. However you get in touch with me, I'm I'm an open book. Um, I would also love to hear from you all. If you've had your tubes removed because they were blocked and you had hydrosalpinx, which is the fluid, and it worked for you, reach out to me. I would love to hear that that success story as, as just hope to get me through. Um, but other than that, thank you all so much for being here. I always appreciate you spending any amount of your day listening to my episodes. Please like, share, and subscribe. Again, it is National Infertility Awareness Week. And any, any education, any awareness, any sharing means so much to so many people. I, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, am now one in six. But you also have friends that are one in six and coworkers and neighbors and people that you probably interact with 
who don't even know that they're going to experience infertility one day. The shares, the education, just bringing awareness to this means the world to me, and I know it does to those people as well. So like I said, please like, subscribe, share. It means so much to me and a lot of people around you. If you want to reach out, you can reach me at everydayinfertility at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram at everydayinfertility as well. Thank you all so much and I will see you next week.